Hey, Bobby, with uh, regards to the ranchers, um, do you, or I guess this is probably the way to say it, like, if I were a rancher, and I decided, like, I listened to this podcast, or I looked on the uh, the Savory Institute stuff and decided, like, this is this is the way to go. Mm-hmm. What is, like, step one in that situation for, for someone in that situation who has a traditional model and wants to kind of move forward into a more holistic management? Yeah. So for producers specifically, you know, the number one best thing to do would be to reach out to the local savory hub. Um, That's the whole premise of having a savory hub is that they provide training and support and education to farmers and ranchers, you know, around the world. And they understand the local nuance in terms of climate, geography, markets, society, politics, et cetera. You know, Savory Institute as a staff of 12 in Colorado can't go out there and say, Hey, you know, you guys, the Maasai in Kenya, here's what you should do exactly on your land. And here's the people you should know. And here's what you should do for your local markets, you know, to be successful. And then, hey, Gauchos in Patagonia, here's what you should know. And then herders in Norway, here's what you should should know. Um, it's impossible for us to be able to, to say all of that and to know all of that. So the savory hubs exist so that they can take that localized informa- information and make it contextually relevant for the, the, the producers in that area. So, you know, the ideal scenario for a producer would be get in touch with your savory hub. Uh, we've got 43 of them around the globe, as I mentioned, and we've got about 10 new hubs coming on board every year as the network continues to grow. Um, if a savory hub is not available or you don't have the, the time or the ability to engage with a local savory hub, we've got online courses at Savory Institute's website that you can go through that run you through everything from the decision-making aspects of holistic management to the grazing planning, to the land planning, to the financial planning, to the biological monitoring. Um, all those exist. We've got eBooks. If you just want to, you know, get a quick read on, on what to do and kind of figure it out on your own. Um, and then there's of course, Alan's textbook called holistic management, which you can buy online. Um, and there's actually, we just came out with the new holistic management handbook. So two different books, their covers look kind of the same. The textbook is the theory behind holistic management. You know, it's, it really gets deep into the weeds on ecosystem function and decision making and all that stuff. It's kind of the why behind it. And then the handbook is really the how to, Um, You know, it's worksheets and graphs and charts, and it's just step-by-step processes of how to implement this at the ground level. So I recommend folks getting both of those books together and reading them in tandem um, if they're trying to change. Bobby, I'm a a huge proponent of beef. I mean, obviously, (laughs) I eat a lot of it. I promote it. I think everybody should eat more of it at least. Um, And you talk about agribusiness, you know, and certainly we, there's no shortage of that in the beef industry. We look at Tyson Foods, we look at Cargo, we look at, uh, what is it, JS or JBS, the other food company, Mm -hmm. the big processors. And, you know, when I look at, and I've actually interacted a little bit with the NCBA, and I'm just wondering, you know, because they represent all of beef and they represent the packers as much as they represent the ranchers. And so, you know, there's kind of a, you know, maybe, maybe everyone's goals are not aligned. How does, how do you guys interact with NCBA or do you, or is that something that is maybe uh, delicate to talk about or what's their, what's, what's been their response to what you guys are preaching or do they even give you the time of day or what's the deal with the NCBA? Uh, so we don't nec- uh, we don't have a specific relationship with the NCBA uh, that I'm aware of, at least. But I, I would say that we don't exist in conflict with one another. Um, I personally, of course, would like to see everything be 100% grass fed, holistically managed, you know, EOV verified, you know, out there in the world. That would be my you know perfect ideal world. But the reality is, I think you alluded to it earlier, is that even if an animal is going off to be fed in a feedlot they're still spending time on pasture for the beginning portion of their life. And the way that that land is managed, the way that they are managed in that beginning phase of their life as a cow calf or as a stalker, um, we can have an effect on that management as well. And so even if someone is running a cow calf operation and then those animals go off to auction and go off to feedlot, we can still influence management at that earlier phase. And in doing so, we're going to create a more resilient landscape. We're still going to have all those climate change benefits. You're still going to be able to increase productivity for that producer who's raising those animals in that cow-calf operation. So, you know, just because the ideal is 100% grass-fed, you know, with no inputs, we shouldn't let 
perfection get in the way of good enough. We can make incremental change in a variety of different ways. I mean, we can do it at the cow-calf operations that are going into feedlots. We can do it at, you know, how are our public lands managed, you know, in terms of public lands, most of them, you know, have no animals that exist there at all. Well, why not give access to ranchers who need access to grass? You know, maybe that can help with fire mitigation. You know, one of my colleagues, Chris Kirsten, he lived in Paradise, California, and he is out there banging the drum about holistic management and getting, you know, producers and brands into the land to market program. And while he was out traveling for savory, his house burned to the ground. If that land would have been properly managed, you know, if, if they would have brought in, uh, you know, herds of goats for fire mitigation, you may have seen different impact on that land. Um, so, you know, this, this ties together from a variety of different pieces. It's not just large scale agriculture in the traditional fashion that we think of it. I think this can be applied in a lot of different ways. Actually, Another way, you had mentioned Trent Hendricks earlier. Um, he's the, the Savory Hub leader out of Missouri um, and one of the founders of Rep Provisions, that brand I had mentioned. He's got a new project um, that he is doing with a large solar company called Silicon Ranch. And so Silicon Ranch has massive solar fields, uh, solar panels uh, all over the country. And so Trent is piloting a new project with them, uh, actually in conjunction with Will Harris from White Oak Pastures um, in Georgia. And what they're doing is they are grazing livestock regeneratively under solar fields. So they're taking renewable energy, which normally you have these big solar fields. And what they do is they either mechanically or chemically treat the fields underneath the solar panels. So they're either mowing it and they're spraying it. Well, what Will and Trent have done is they've come in and they said, well, instead of physically or, you know, instead of mechanically or chemically treating these lands, why don't we biologically treat them? So instead of spraying chemicals all over it and destroying it or mowing it up, they're just bringing in their livestock. And now you've got renewable energy, which is great because, you know, that's what a lot of people are saying in the climate change space is we need to decarbonize our energy system. Yes, we do need to do that, but that's just stopping the damage that we've already inflicted. And then we need to heal what's already been done. We need to draw the carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's what they're doing with the livestock. So it's this kind of beautiful synergy of renewable energy plus regenerative agriculture all on the same piece of land. And I think it's just a great example of, you know, it's not just traditional agricultural practices that we're looking at here. There's a variety of different innovative way, innovative ways that are, people are starting to do. And I'm sure there's going to be much more into the future that we can all get behind.